This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. I saw the SS Great Britain at Bristol in the fall of 2013. Set in a plexiglass firmament with an inch of chlorinated water sloshing about to resemble waves, she is certainly a spectacle. Her engine churns slow revolutions under a glass skylight, with a recorded tape of huffing and chuffing to add verisimilitude. Steamer trunks pile up convincingly in the passageways. Waxwork children play on the floor of a reconstructed cabin. In the gilt-edged dining room, a trick of audio technology filters ghostly conversation through hidden speakers. A trifle more gammon, Lady Weatherall? Oh, oh, I feel I may be ill. What say you to a game of whist later, Doctor? At the far end, a string quartet plays Mendelssohn from Empty Chairs. There is irony in the fact that this ship, derided as a freak and shunted off the Atlantic run for a hard-scrabble life in the Antipodes, should be the sole surviving 19th-century example of that quintessential Victorian innovation, the steam ocean liner. All the others are gone. A ship is a mortal structure that begins to corrode the moment it touches water. Like ourselves, it is born, lives, and dies in the span of a few decades. Yet the Great Britain achieved immortality of a kind. Her persistence owes less to preservation than neglect. Abandoned and forgotten in her own time, she was allowed to rust away in a sandbar in a remote corner of the globe for nearly a hundred years. Had she been the success her creator envisioned, it is almost certain she would have been retired and scrapped long hence. Still, I cannot help but feel that Isambard Kingdom Brunel would be pleased to see her as she is today. She rests in the city he called home, which is still accessed through a system of railway lines and trestles he laid down. The elegant neo-Gothic terminus, only a few short blocks from the Great Britain's birth, was designed by him as well. On the one hand, the ship's presence in our century is testament to the innovations she and he pioneered. Iron hull, screw propeller, and dimensions that dwarfed all of the craft. Whatever the Great Britain's failings as a commercial liner, these advances are incontrovertible. It is right that they should be preserved and honored. On the other hand, like her ill-fated successor, the Great Eastern, the Great Britain was more show than ship. Both vessels were at their best tied to the pier, massive and puissant. On the open seas, they were miserable failures. Indeed, the only profit either ever turned was in harbor, welcoming crowds of gawkers for tuppence ahead. Hence, her afterlife is doubly appropriate, stuffed and mounted, a spectacle of 19th century engineering for multitudes of day-trippers in shorts and baseball caps. If the experience on board seems a trifle unreal, well, that too is as it should be. The ship herself is unreal, a phantasmagoria of science and showmanship. She exists between the tangible realm of technology and the monstrous imaginings of Jules Verne, in other words, at the limit of imagination. This was heady stuff for designers, engineers, owners, and the public at large. They loved the implied challenge, the ever-moving horizon between the possible and the absurd. Like most mirages, it shimmers at the corners, always just beyond reach. But that does not discredit its lure. Some of the greatest minds of the century sought it, with the same fervor as any intrepid explorer would an unknown continent, and built ships like the Great Britain to carry them there.